Okay, so we're going to look at generic methods. And the question is, write a generic method named print array to print the contents of an array. So that's the main part of the question there. We just have to worry about that part for now. Okay, so we're going to write a, a generic method. Let's not write a generic for now. Let's just write a method that prints the contents of an array. Okay, we'll make it generic later. Okay, and then the next bit is to write a tester class um, to use the method to display some data. Okay, but we're going to focus on this for now. And we're not going to worry about the generic part for now. We're just going to write the method and worry about the making it generic later. Okay, so it's public class. Uh, I'll, I'll put in a file called q345.java. So it's going to be public class q345. You can call your question whatever you like. We're going to answer questions 3, 4, and 5 inside this uh, class. So uh, let's create a method. Public static. Oops, static void and it's got to be called print array and we'll take in an array of strings okay so that's our non-generic this is a non-generic method we'll make our methods non-generic to start with and then we'll look at how we can make them generic okay and why we want to make them generic so we'll talk about all that that's all coming up okay we need a little main program private or public I'll do everything into one class. I won't have a separate tester class. I'll do it all in one class, just to keep it simple for this for this video. Okay, so I'm not swapping and changing between files. So public static void main string args string square brackets args. Okay, now in here we want to declare an array of strings and invoke our print array, array method. Okay, so I'll just set up an array of strings names i'll call it names and it's just going to be a hard-coded array of strings open curly brackets mike frankie and jane i just have three names for now close curly brackets semicolon okay so there's our array of strings now we want to print that array so we'll just pass the array which is called names to our print array method which we're still working on above Okay, so that's what we've done. Declared an array of stri strings called names, and we're going to pass that to our print array method to print it to the screen. Okay, so let's now uh, print our array of strings. So we'll use a for loop, and we could use a, a for each loop if we wanted to. I'll just use a slightly longer version. Start at, start at index location 0, s is less than array.length, so the size of the array array.length s plus plus to whoops plus plus I'm working on a very small keyboard here um, okay so there's our loop and we're just going to go system out print line array whoops and then we're going to look up the array element at that location so square brackets s round bracket okay so we're passing the array in here into the print array method. It's going to be called array inside our method. We're going to loop through from starting at index location zero. S is less than array.length. So we're going to, if, if the array is 10, 10 strings long, we're going to go from zero to nine. Okay, so that's where the length, com length comes in. And we're just going to print, print line the data in the array at that location. Okay, and keep looping until we, end, until we get to the end of the array. Okay, now we could run that code now. That's perfectly runnable. Okay, and there's the results. So Mike, Frankie, Jan. So we just see what we expect. We just see the three strings on the screen. So far, so good. So we've got a non-generic method to print an array of strings. Let's now create another non-generic method. And I'll just close it out the window. Uh, to print an array of integers. Okay. And we're not changing anything else. I've, I've kept the array name the same. It's still array.length and it's still array square brackets s to get to the element of each location in the array. So nothing's changed. So you might be thinking now, holy mackerel, we've got two methods which are identical. The only thing that's changed is the data type. Okay. And maybe if we're doing other work in the array here inside the method, 
we might have strings declared in here and maybe integers declared in here. Depends on what our methods are doing. But for just printing the array to the screen, we just need a little for loop and a print line statement. Okay, so here we're an array of strings. Here we're an array of integers. So that's effectively duplicate code. Okay, this code here is identical to the code up here. The only thing that's changed is our data type. So we've got two non-generic methods, which are, for all intents and purposes, identical. Okay, so we've got duplicate code, which is a nasty situation to have, because then you've got to maintain two lots of code and keep them in step. Let's declare an array of integers. And I'm going to just copy what I've got above, and I'll call it numbers, or numbers, <laughs> numbers. And it's an array of integers, so I'll have 33 in the first location, 44, minus 12, 0, and 4. Okay, so that's our array of integers there. Okay, numbers. And we'll call the print array with numbers. Okay, so the first one, we've got an array of strings, and we're calling print array. And here we've got an array of integers, and we're calling print array again. Okay, so Java looks at the data type being passed in. And here it's an array of strings. So Java looks for a method that can take the array of strings. And there it is there. There's a print, print array method, and it takes an array of strings. So that's the code we'll, that will run. Okay. Down here, we've got an array of integers, and we're calling the print array method for our array of integers. So Java looks for a print array method that can take in an array of integers. And it finds it there, and that's the one that will run. Okay, so Java looks at the type, type of data being passed to the method, and invokes the right one. And that's, of course, something you'll remember from prior weeks. That's a topic or concept called overloading. We've got multiple methods with the same name, and which one gets invoked depends on the type of data or the number of parameters that you're passing to the method. Okay, very important technique, very useful technique for programmers, because it saves you having to remember multiple method names. We don't want to call our methods things like print array of strings and print array of integers, because then we have to worry about print array of doubles and print array of bytes and print array of chars and print array of who knows what. Okay, so we don't have to remember silly method names like that. Uh, so that's where overloading comes in. We get the same method name, just change the data type or the number of types of data going to the method or the number of parameters going to the method. Okay, so that's overloading. Multiple methods with the same name. That's all it means. Okay, so here we've got an overloaded non-generic method, which takes an array of strings. And here we've got an overloaded, non-generic method, which takes an array of integers. But like I've said before, those methods are identical. The only thing that changes is the data type being passed in. Okay, so let's run our program. And there's the output. So we've got our three strings and then our five integers coming out to the screen. Okay, just like we'd expect. So there's our data coming out to the screen there. Mike, Frankie, Jane, that's the data from the array, and 3344 minus 1204. So it's just the data coming from our integer array here, going out of the screen. Okay, so that's our output. We've got, so we've done the first part. We've, we've written a not, well, written non-generic methods, and we've written a little bit of tester code to test out our print array methods. Um, and we've got an array of integers and an array of strings. So we've, we've sort of partly answered the question already. So why would you want to make your methods generic? Okay, and the, and the reason is you don't want to be writing the same method multiple times and just changing data types. That's 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 one of the big reasons. And okay, this is, these are only silly little examples we're working on here, but the concepts apply to much bigger and more serious examples. For example, if we're sorting data, we wouldn't we don't want to have to sort an array of strings and then have another copy of that code to sort an array of integers, and then have another copy of that code to sort an array of chars, and another copy of that code to sort an array of doubles, that would be crazy, okay? So the idea is you want to write a method once, but have it apply to numerous types of data. That's where generic methods come in. Okay, so sorting data, getting the biggest or smallest from a list of data, saving to a reading from file or database. These are all things we want to just write once and be able to pass in any sort of data um, and have it work. Okay, so that's where generic methods come in. So let's now make this a generic version of our method. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is delete our method that works for integers. We don't want, we don't want multiple copies of the same code. 
<laughs> okay, that just means we have to maintain it in multiple places, which is not desirable. Okay, so let's make this version, this, this method now generic. So it works for any type of array, of any, any array of data. Okay, uh, so the first thing we want to do is just replace that. Now you can do various things here. Uh, you, you basically just replace it with a letter. Okay, and um, T is a good one, or well, you can use just about any, any letter you like. And the other thing you need to do is just signal to Java that it's a generic method. So whatever your letter you use here, you'll generally use there as well. Okay, and that's it. That's all we need to do. So now our method's generic. So you just have to write a little bit of clever code, change string to T, and put a less than T greater than there, and that's all we need to do. We've now got a generic method. Control one, control two, and you'll see our data's coming out as before. Mike, Frankie, Jane, 3344 minus 12, and so on. Okay. Okay, so we've shortened our code down and we've saved duplication. So that's win-win. That's a win-win situation. Okay, so now we've got a generic print array method uh, and we can call that for strings, integers. So any sort of array, an array of strings, an array of integers, an array of doubles, an array of chars, an array of customers, an array of products, an array of employees, whatever we want. Now that method will work for, because it means any data type. It works for any data type. So that's a generic method. Let's go back and look at our question. So write a generic method named print array to print the contents of an array. We've done that. Write a tester class that uses a print array method to print an array of integers. We've done that. We've done the array of strings. We've got to do the array of doubles and the array of chars. So we've got two arrays to go. We'll do one of those. We don't need to do them all. We'll just do one of them for our little examples here and, and uh, you can finish off <laughs> on your own. So we'll do an array of doubles double and I'll call it doubles equals 2.14 3.1 2.9 minus 3.7 and that'll do us we don't want to go too too many okay and then we're going to pass that array to our print array method Okay, so now we've got print array working on names, which is strings, numbers, which is an array of integers, and doubles, which is an array of doubles. Okay, let's run that and see how we go. And there's our output. So you can see our doubles are coming out down here. So we've got strings, integers, doubles. So our generic, our, our, our print array method now is generic, and we've answered all parts of that, apart from the characters, an array of characters, and I'll leave that for you to work on as a little practice one. Okay. We're 99% there, it's just that last little bit to do. Okay, that's just adding an array of characters down here and putting characters inside here. In fact, let's do it. Okay, just in case anyone's stuck. So, character, characters, and don't forget in Java, characters have got single quotes. So, not double quotes, double quotes is strings, single quotes is characters. Okay, so I've got three characters in my characters array, and I'll pass that through to the print array method. And that's it, we're done. Control one, control two, and there's our character data coming out as well. So ZDE, we've come out down the bottom. Okay, so everything's working. We've now fully answered that question. We can tick that off the list. That's a job well done. Had that made sense? Uh, it pause, might be a good idea to pause the video now and just review this on your own and work through it on your own. Make sure you can do it and we'll build on that for the next part of the question. Okay, so question four says, overload the generic method print array created above in question three so that it takes two additional integer arguments, the from and the to. The idea is that we want to pass through two integers and have it just print part of the array between those two index locations. A call to the, this method prints only the des designated portion of the array, the elements of the array between the, the from index and the to index, inclusive of both from and to. Okay, so if we pass through the values three and five, we want to loop through and display values or display the whatever array values for index locations three to five. OK, 
Okay, so we're going to pass through two integers for our indexes, start and stop indexes. Uh, you need to validate from and to. If either is out of range, the overloaded print array method should throw an invalid subscript exception. Otherwise, print array should print the elements accordingly. Okay, so we've got a little bit of ex exception handling here going on. And we're going to throw an exception if the indexes are out of bounds. Otherwise, we'll just go ahead and print the array. Okay, so a little bit more here. We might leave this to a little bit later. We'll do, the, we'll do this part for now. So we're going to create an overloaded version of that method that uh, takes in those two extra integers. Okay, so there's our first version of the method. Let's now do a second version. It's going to be a generic method as well, uh, but it's going to take in some integers as well. So, comma, int, and I'll put these down on the next line so we can see them in the, in the screen. Uh, int from index, int to index. You can call them whatever you like, from and to, or from index to, or to and to index. Okay, so we won't worry about the validation for now. We'll leave that to the next next part. So we're going to loop through now from from index and loop. Okay, it said inclusive, so from index to to index inclusive. So we're going to make that a less than or equal to. Okay, so we're going to start at from index and keep printing out items until we get to to index. So it's up to and including to index. Okay, whatever value that is. And that's it. So now we've got two generic methods. They're generic because they take any data type. That's how we know they're generic. And we've also got them so they're overloaded. So we've got overloaded generic methods now. Okay. Here's number one. And down here's number two. They're both called print array. This one takes an array of whatever. And this one takes an array of whatever plus two integers. So there's two methods with the same name. And which one gets called depends on the data being passed to it. Okay, so um, for example, down here with my name, oh, I'll, I'll pick a bigger number, I'll pick, pick a bigger array. We could print just from one to three. Okay, so that's location zero, that's location one, that's location two, that's location three. So for this, for this call to print array here, we should see the numbers 44, minus 12, and zero come out on screen. And I might comment out these ones just so we can just focus on the numbers for now. Might have been coming out of strings. Okay, so if I just write the little index locations on, on top here, that's location zero, that's location one, that's location two, that's location three near eight, that's that's location four. It's a value four, and it happens to be at like index location four as well. Just a coincidence. Okay, so here we're telling the print array method to just print out the like the values from index one to index three. So 44 minus 12. And zero is what we should see on screen. Okay, so control one, control two, and there's our data being output. Just the values we're expecting, 44 minus 12 and zero. Okay. So everything's working great there, just as we expected it, it's, it's working, so that's great. Uh, we'll go back up here to our question. Um, we've done that part, so it takes an array, so it takes two additional arguments, we've done all that, we've done that, so we've completed that part. You need to validate the from and the to index values to make sure we're not out of bounds with the array. If either is out of bounds, the overloaded print array method should throw an invalid subscript exception. Okay. Otherwise, it should just print the elements. So we need to check the, check the index locations and make sure we're inside the bounds of the array. Okay, so let's proceed on. We'll take a copy of that in our clipboard because we're going to need that exception name there. And we'll go down to our print array method down here, the one that takes the indexes. Um, there it is. And we'll do our test. Before we do any processing, we'll do our test on the index values. Now there's three situations where we might throw an exception and the command's going to be, okay, throw a new number format exception, or invalid subscript, subscript exception, sorry. That's our command to throw an exception. So the first one is if the from index if the from index is less than zero, that's a definite error. Okay. And the next one that might cause a problem is if the to index is greater than or equal to the array.length. 
So if the array length is 10, the valid subscripts are 0 to 9. Okay, so we want to make sure the two index is less than array.length. So if it's greater than or equal to array.length, we've got a problem. And I'll put that on the next slide, just so we're working with our slides here. And the third situation is when from index is greater than to index, then we've got a problem as well. Okay, so if from index is less than zero, we've got a, we've got a problem. If two in indexes outside the array length, so it's greater than or equal to the array dot length, or if from index is greater than the two index, then we've got the indexes out of order. Okay, and we've got a closing curly bracket there, a closing round bracket there to end our if statement. And if any of those is true, we've got the ors there, double vertical bar means or, so if that's true, or that's true, or that's true, we're going to throw a new invalid subscript exception. Okay, we need to make a little change down here in our main program. Okay, and again, I'm taking a, taking a copy of that in the, in the clipboard. So down here, whatever we call, I might do it around the whole lot, just so if we comment those out again, we can uh, make use of them. So I'll indent all of this code. Okay, I'll turn off wrapping so that I can not have everything wrapped everywhere all the time. Okay, so there's our try block. Inside our try block goes everything that might raise an exception. Okay, and I'm just putting all of the print array um, method calls in there. Probably this one here is the only one that would cause any exceptions at the moment because this is the only one that does any range checking on the indexes because uh, they're being passed in. So we could just technically just put that, that line of code there inside the try block. I'll put them all in for now because we might change this later to just print out part of this sub array of strings. We might change, change this one here later to just print out part of the array of doubles and so on. Okay, so we've got the try part. Now we need the catch. And we're catching invalid subscript exceptions. Okay, and I'll call that error. Okay, so it's the object we're declaring of type invalid subscript exception. Okay, and we want the close, opening brace, curly brace, and closing curly brace. And in here, we're going to decide what to do with our error. Are we going to display a dialog to the user? Are we going to display some data in a label to tell them an error has happened? Are we going to color code something red to indicate an error has happened? We don't have any GUI here. It's just a simple little example. So maybe we'll just print out a stack trace to the screen. And it's not the case there. Print stack trace. Uh, and uppercase T as well. Uppercase T, sorry. Yep. <clears throat> and so we've got part of the equation now. Now we've got something uh, tricky to do. Uh, and we've got to declare our invalid subscript exceptions as another class. Okay, so we need, we need a new file. We could do it all in a one file, but I'm going to do this in a separate file because it's a good thing to put in a separate file. <laughs> Because once you set it up, you, you, can, you can pretty well set and forget. Okay, so we'll create, create a new document, public class. Okay, invalid subscript exception, open curly brackets, close curly brackets. I want to now save it as a Java file, dot Java. Okay, so the color coding comes on now. So inside here, we need to set up three methods. Okay, the first one, three constructors actually. The first one is a constructor which just takes no parameters, so the default constructor. And then we need another method that takes a string parameter. Call it message or whatever you like. And the third one is a constructor that takes a string and a, and a throwable object. So we've got the string and, I'll put it on the next line, Sorry, uppercase T, throwable, and then whatever you want to call it. Uh, cause isn't a bad one, throwable cause. Okay, so the cause of the exception. Okay, so the first one, handle, how do we handle that? Well, we haven't got an error message, so we're just going to make one up. And we're calling the this constructor down here. We're going to pass through a string to this constructor. Okay, so this, and we'll just pass through a string in valid subscript it's 
something like that. Sounds good. If you want to say error in Bella Scrub Script, you can do that as well. Whatever makes sense to you. Okay. And this one, the one that takes the string, we're going to call a superclass constructor. Okay, superclass constructor, so it can handle the, mess the error, and we just pass through the message to that superclass constructor, and that reminds us straight away we're missing something here. Okay, so we need to so we need to extend uh, another another exception class that's already built into Java or one that we've created. So we'll just make it a runtime exception for now. Extends, and a common question students often ask is, well. Where does my exception class fit within the hierarchy? Uh, and the best thing to do for now is just ask your tutor or your or your uh, lecturer, and they'll be able to tell you for sure. Uh, it just comes with experiences where, where 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 it's best to fit your exceptions in into the existing class hierarchy in Java. We'll we'll make it a runtime exception. So it extends runtime exception. Okay. So down here, the default constructor passes through a string to this constructor down here. So we're just passing through error invalid subscript. So they can throw an exception without providing a, a reason. And then they're going to get invalid error invalid subscript as a reason. Or else if they raise an exception and pass through a message, that's the message is going to get passed through to the superclass constructor. And the other one is that they're going to uh, raise an exception and also include the cause, which is another throwable object that they're going to pass through. And again, we're just going to pass that up to the superclass. The superclass knows how to deal with these errors. It's built into Java. We just need to fit our exceptions into that exception hierarchy. So a throwable super, a super message comma cause is how we do that. So it's a very short and simple class, but you need three, three constructors. A default constructor, a parameterized constructor that takes a string, and a parameterized constructor that takes a string, and a throwable object. Okay. And pretty well, you're passing everything back up to the superclass. Okay, and this one here to save a little bit of code, we're just using this, meaning for the current exception, pass through this string. So we're calling this constructor here and passing through the string as a message. So, so far, so good. We can compile it with Control One. Oh, we've got an error there, and what it is, I can see now by looking up at the line up here. I've put the round brackets in the file name, which is silly of me. So it should just be exception without the round brackets. So I, was just, I, I had the round brackets in my buffer as well, so they accidentally got copied into the file name. So that should work now. Control 1, that's good. Okay, so back in our main class, we've got the, the print stack trace there for the error object. Uh, we've got the try catch in place. Uh, I think that's everything we need. We'll control 1 there. And we'll control 1 here. Everything's looking good. We'll run it. Okay, so there's our data coming out for that part of the array. Let's now make it so our array index is out of bounds. We'll make that a minus three. So from index location one to minus three, which is of course completely invalid. Control one, compiles, okay. And here we get an exception. So there's our exception being uh, handled. We've got the error invalid subscript come out. So you can tell from that it ran the default constructor, and I'll show you how that works. So we just we just said throw throw new invalid exception. So we we, we call that's that's calling the in, the default constructor. We're not passing through any parameters. If we were to pass through a different message, I could pass through something else like I'm just passing through something silly here. So I'm going to pass through the string hello error instead. <laughs> okay, just to show you how you can change it and set your own error messages. Control 1, Control 2, and now we're getting hello error come out. Okay, so that's how it works. The first one, without without providing a string, it called the default constructor. When we, when we pass through a string, that's calling the parameterized constructor that takes just a string. Okay, so throw a new uh, exception that we just created. We've got our exception class here with our three constructors, a default constructor, parameterized constructor number one, parameterized constructor number two. And that's basically it. We've, we've finished the question. So let's go back up and read again. So I'll turn back line wrapping on. Uh, overload the generic method print array. Um, yep, so we've done that. 
You need to validate from and to. If either is out of range, the overloaded print array method should throw an invalid subscript exception. Otherwise, print array should print the elements. So we've done everything. There is one last thing we could do just for com completeness because this code here is basically still the same as that, but this handles only part of the array. So is there any way we could chop that loop out? Because we could be doing a whole lot more than just printing an array. We could be saving it to file and doing all sorts of things. We don't want to duplicate that multiple times. So we want to try and make use of our methods wherever we can and call them. So up here, we could call print array for, and, and pass through our array, array from zero to array.length. Okay, so I can now take out this code. I can now delete that. Delete, we don't need it. So I've shortened our method by three lines of code. It's only three lines of code, but like I said, we could be talking about serious lines of code in here where we've got a, dozens of lines of code duplicated in two methods. So whenever you can, try and call your other methods to get the work done. So here I'm print array method one, which takes just an array, is calling in the overloaded other print array method that takes in the array plus the two indexes. So we're just passing in zero to array length, okay? And actually it should be array length minus one because it's the last index, we're talking about indexes there. So it should be from zero to array length minus one. Okay, let's just make sure that works. We'll, we'll do the full array here by just calling print array. And I'll put out a message, system out dot print line all and down here I'll do another one part and I'll put a slash in before it okay for new line so we'll see all and then all of the data in the array all of those values coming out and then for part we'll just see the values between <laughs> index one and index three. So we'll see those three values coming out. Okay, so that's testing both the methods. And our first print array method is invoking the second one, which takes in the subscripts. So zero to array length minus one means print the full array. Control one, control two. So there's our output. The all does do the whole array and the part just does do this, those three elements. And that's about as good as we can make it for this for this little exercise now. Like I said earlier, we're just dealing with silly little methods, but it's to highlight the points. The points are very valid and and, and serious. Uh, and that is, you don't want to duplicate, co duplicate code everywhere, and you want to try and keep things generic so can, a method can work with any type of data uh, within reason. And um, a good way to start is the way we started. Just write the married methods in a non-generic way, and then look at, the, look at the patterns, and look at the code, and then you'll find out how to make it uh, generic. And it's usually just easy, like replacing the data types with T and let Java know that you're making the method generic by putting less than T greater than there as a little uh, symbol to Java that this is a generic method. It works with any type of data. Okay, so I hope that was useful. Feel free to discuss these two questions on the forums or amongst, amongst yourselves in little study groups. And um, make sure you write the code yourself and <laughs> follow the same thing I did. You can, you can, you can pause the video and, and take as long as you like, but make sure you write the code yourself. You're going to think by watching the video, oh, that was easy. I could do that. But you've really got to write the code yourself and do it a few times to different problems. And then you become comfortable with the topics. Okay. Thanks for watching. Take care.